All right, guys, uh, sorry for the delay. Why don't we get started? So, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you in the room who I haven't met, I'm Arielle, I'm one of the PGY5s. So, before we get started, I have several people to thank without whom I wouldn't have been able to put this uh, talk together. So, first, Dr. Kasilowitz, who is my supervisor and who is really helpful from both an ED and ICU trained background to provide her perspective on this literature. And to Dr. Clark, who's been my mentor for several years now and who actually suggested this talk to me. Dr. Millington, who's one of our critical care docs and who was really helpful for his deep and nuanced understanding of the IVC literature, as well as Dr. Ritzy, one of our ED POCUS experts who provided his perspective on the literature. So as an outline about what we'll talk about in the next hour, first we'll review our physiologic goals when giving fluids. Then we'll look at the history of fluid resuscitation and sepsis, and the growing body of literature suggesting that too much fluid is harmful. Lastly, we'll spend the bulk of the talk on a few methods of assessing whether the patient in front of you will benefit from more fluid. Now, there's lots of ongoing debate about which type of fluid to give, but we won't get into that today. However, stay tuned for the results of the fluid trial being conducted here and at many other centers. So we'll start with a representative case. This is Mabel. She's 74 years old, and she lives at home completely independently with her husband. She has a history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, some chronic kidney disease, and osteoarthritis. And Mabel's septic. She presented tachycardic, febrile, and hypotensive to the ED. She had some shortness of breath on her history, but she also had a grossly positive urinalysis. You've given her appropriate broad-spectrum antibiotics, and so far you've given her three liters of crystalloid. Unfortunately, after those three liters, she's still hypotensive and tachycardic, with features of ongoing shock, both on her clinical exam and on her labs. So I want to get a show of hands. I know it's early in the morning. But what would you do next for Mabel? So who would give an additional liter of crystalloid? OK, very few hands. Um, who would give some colloid, maybe some albumin at this point? No one. Okay, who would start some norepinephrine? Lots of hands. Who would wait until ICU arrives? No one, okay, and who says they need more information? Besides like labs, chest x-ray, fine, all that. Um, if you need more information that's not your kind of, your workup, I haven't shown you your chest x-ray, your ECG, what else would be helpful to you at this point? Goals, <laughs> goals of care we heard, okay. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, none of these answers or, or some combination of them is necessarily a wrong one, except probably sitting on the patient until ICU arrives. Um, but my goal today is to give you a few other tools in considering whether this patient is going to benefit from more fluids. And the big question is, is this patient still fluid responsive? Now, I'm going to throw the question again to the group. Show of hands. When you're assessing fluid responsiveness, are you using vitals to make that decision? Okay, a few kind of nods. Okay, what about your clinical exam? Okay, I see more nods than hands. What about ultrasound? Some hesitant half hands. Okay, and then what about some kind of other test? Okay, I hear lots of murmurs, but uh, people are very indecisive as to what they're actually using for fluid responsiveness, which is a good thing because we'll talk about it. So we know from studies of critically ill patients that after their very initial resuscitation, only half of them will actually respond to further fluid boluses in the form of an increase in their cardiac output. And patients might tolerate extra volume, but this doesn't actually mean that they'll respond to it. And this is a key difference for which we need to go back to some physiology to really understand why it's such an important difference. Okay, so when we're resuscitating someone, what are the targets that we look at to decide whether our resuscitation goals are being met? There's lots of different parameters we can look at. So you can look at clinical things like level of consciousness, amount of modeling, your vitals, or lab-guided, such as lactate, although that's a whole other discussion. But at its most basic, all of our resuscitation goals have one thing in common, which is improving the patient's perfusion. So we're going to talk about an equation that you probably learned in med school and hope to forget forever. Um, but last year, I came to love it again. 
I think it really explains the physiologic basis for all of the variables that we modify during our resuscitation. So please bear with me. When we talk about a patient's perfusion, what we're really talking about is the oxygen delivery to their tissues, which is a product of the total oxygen in their blood, as well as their cardiac output. Now, the oxygen content in their blood depends on the amount of hemoglobin they have and how well saturated it is, which is that factor on the left, and to an almost insignificant degree, the amount of dissolved oxygen in their blood. So that's your arterial oxygen content. Now, their cardiac output, as you know, depends on their stroke volume and their heart rate. Their stroke volume depends on three things, their preload, their afterload, and their contractility. So, when we're giving fluids for a patient in shock, we're assuming that they're going to benefit from increased preload, and ultimately their oxygen delivery will improve as a result. I'm hoping you're all following. Get ready for one more blast from the past, the Frank Starling curve. So this will be a review to everyone. In the graph, the patient's LV preload is on the x-axis, with stroke volume on the y-axis. And the shape of the curve indicates that when the patient is towards the left of the curve, he or she will respond positively to a fluid bolus by increasing their stroke volume and, as a result, their cardiac output. Now, in the literature, a patient who's fluid responsive will increase their cardiac output by 10% or more in response to a fluid bolus. However, as we shift further towards the right of the Frank Starling curve, you have diminishing or even zero returns in the form of increased stroke volume for that same fluid bolus. And the orange line on the curve indicates that for patients who have poor ventricular function, whether it's from pre-existing disease, an acute MI, or sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy, the curve will flatten out at a quicker rate than for someone who's got normal car uh, cardiovascular function. So this basic physiology has been well understood for decades. And over the next few slides, I'm going to review some of the seminal studies that put this physiology into practice. The first is the study from 2001 that changed the game in terms of how we applied physiology to the patient in front of us, and that's early goal-directed therapy by Manny Rivers. Now, this was a single-center ED-based study that sought to improve outcomes in sepsis care by standardizing therapy. They studied 263 patients with severe sepsis, and importantly, entry into the study required a fluid bolus of 20 to 30 mils per kilo. Patients in the early goal-directed therapy arm received targeted bolus of crystalloid to maintain a CVP of 8 to 12, vasopressors for a MAP of greater than 65, and then transfusion or dobutamine if their central venous O2 sat was still low. The control at this time was standard sepsis therapy. And early goal-directed therapy in this trial produced an absolute risk reduction in mortality of 16%. So the mortality in the study was really high, 46% in the control arm versus 30% in the early goal-directed arm. And this was unheard of, and it, to this day remains one of the only overwhelmingly positive ED-ICU-based studies in the last 20 years. As expected, the early goal-directed therapy group got more aggressive therapy. So they received more fluids, more vasopressors, and more inotropes. And the intervention group received five liters of fluid versus three and a half liters of fluid in the crystalloid group over the first six hours of their care. Now, 15 years later, Three large landmark trials were published in the New England Journal again that examined mortality in septic shock for patients with usual care versus early goal-directed therapy or protocolized therapy in one of the trials. And these made big news because across the trials, there was no difference in mortality between usual care and early goal-directed therapy. Importantly, however, these patients were still getting a lot of fluid and a lot of vasopressors in the first several hours of their care. If you can't see from the back the comparison charts of fluid across the studies, in all of process, promise, and arise, patients received between four and four and a half liters of fluid in the first six hours of care in the usual care arm. And without getting into a full comparison between the studies, the most common interpretation of all of these trials is that these trials show that our standard care, 15 years after the Rivers trial, now reflects the principles that the River study sought to incorporate, which was early fluids, early vasopressors, and most importantly, early antibiotic therapy. Mortality in these studies was also significantly better than in the River study, between 14% in ARISE and 25% in PROMISE. So now that our standard sepsis management has improved mortality so much, we're starting to examine which parts of care provide the greatest benefit. 
And part of the motivation to examine this is financial in nature. So in the United States, funding to hospital emergency departments depends on completion of a sepsis bundle within the first three hours of care. So Chris Seymour and his group in New York last year did a population data study examining which components of the sepsis bundle made the greatest difference to care. They found that, as has been shown in other studies, longer time to antibiotics was associated with increased mortality, but that a delay to fluids beyond the three hours was actually not associated with increased mortality. Now, I certainly don't want to dissuade anyone from giving an appropriate fluid bolus for a patient in shock, and ensuring adequate preload along with early antibiotics is still the standard of care for these patients. However, there are some harms to giving too much fluid without reassessing the patient, which is what we'll talk about. So first, I want to get a show of hands again as to what people think they're giving for a fluid bolus. So who thinks for their septic patients they're giving 10 mils per kilo as a bolus? Okay, no one? 20 mils per kilo? A few more hands, 30 mils per kilo? Okay, maybe half the room, 40 mils per kilo? None, okay. And I don't really think about mils per kilo, we're dealing with adults. <laughs> okay, a few. Um, so we'll talk about what the ideal dose is, but the bottom line is, despite all of our research, we don't actually know what an appropriate dose is for a fluid bolus in our septic patients. I'll briefly talk about the physiology and then about a few studies that demonstrate the harms of giving too much fluid, and some of the consequences of which we don't see immediately in the ED, but then spend days trying to reverse in hospital. So when we give too much fluid, there are several potential consequences. From a forward flow perspective, overload to the RV can impede your LV output via intraventricular interdependence. Now, normally your RV is small and crescent-shaped, as you can see on the left of the diagram, and we've seen on parasternal short axis view with ultrasound. But with excessive volume loading, your RV can balloon out with the septum bulging into the LV and decreasing that LV preload. And in terms of backward failure, we've all seen pulmonary edema from LV volume overload, but you can also get back above fluid causing liver congestion, bowel wall edema, and renal dysfunction. The kidney is encapsulated, so when it gets edematous, the renal vein pressures can increase markedly, thus decreasing your forward renal blood flow. Now, if we shift to a more clinical focus, multiple studies have shown that in critically ill patients, too much fluid can actually kill. In studies of early goal-directed therapy, two-thirds of patients demonstrated fluid overload within 24 hours, which was then associated with both an increased risk of fluid-related interventions like thoracentesis and diuresis, and a nearly two times increased risk of in-hospital mortality. Other studies have also demonstrated that a positive fluid balance is associated with increased mortality, and we know from the FACT study that patients who have ARDS do better with a restrictive fluid strategy. So speaking of the potential harms of fluid, I want to briefly talk about a very controversial study from a few years ago in septic patients. This is the FEAST study, and I think it's important because it's actually one of the only studies that has assessed the ideal dose of resuscitation fluid. So this was a study in Uganda that assessed children with severe febrile illness and impaired perfusion. These children either got no fluid bolus or a 20 to 40 mil per kilo bolus of either NS or 5% albumin, depending on the degree of hypotension that they presented with. The study's findings were really alarming. So by the 48-hour endpoint, 10.6% of the bolus group um, of patients had died, compared with 7.3% of the no bolus group, for a relative risk of death with bolus fluids of 1.4. Now, it's important to be clear, these are not the patients that we see, obviously. These children were in resource-poor settings. 60% had malaria as the source of their sepsis, and one-third were severely anemic. And the higher mortality rates in the fluid bolus group were thought to at least in part be due to hemodilution in patients who are already significantly anemic. Um, but still, the results of the trial are really in contrast to everything we previously understood about bolus fluids and sepsis. And they were actually enough to make the AHA in their 2015 PALS update modify their recommendations for fluids and pediatric septic shock. So they now state that a 20 mil per kilo bolus is recommended for uh, pediatric patients in septic shock, but that providers should be reassessing after every bolus, and that in particular in resource-poor settings, IV fluids should be given with extreme caution. 
The FEES trial aside, there are ongoing studies in adult patients with septic shock to assess whether a restricted fluid strategy after an initial bolus is beneficial. So Classic finished its feasibility phase in Denmark and Refresh is ongoing in Australia and New Zealand right now. And you may have heard of the ongoing U.S. CLOVER study, which stands for Crystalloid Liberal or Vasopressor Early Resuscitation in Sepsis, which actually made the New York Times a few weeks ago over criticism of its vasopressor first strategy for the restrictive fluids arm. All this to say, the right dose of fluids for a patient in septic shock is still under study. In terms of our expert consensus guidelines, the surviving sepsis guidelines recommend that patients with severe sepsis or septic shock receive a 30 mL per kilo crystalloid bolus, which they acknowledge is a strong recommendation based on low quality of evidence. And just to translate this for our brains to think more easily, for a 70 kilogram patient, a 30 mL per kilo bolus is two liters. In their 2018 update, the surviving sepsis campaign also strongly recommends that after that initial bolus, you should document a reassessment of your patients. So by their recommendations, this could include a focused exam, a CVP, a central venous O2 stat, bedside ultrasound, or a dynamic reassessment of your patients. And we'll focus the majority of the rest of the talk on that last point, which is dynamic reassessments of our patients. So the argument I'm hoping you'll buy by now is that fluids are a drug, like anything else that we give intravenously. There are obviously significant downsides to giving too little fluid, but so too are there problems with giving too much. And so we need to be continually reevaluating whether our fluid loading is effective. Unfortunately, our physical exam findings have been found in small studies to be completely unhelpful for assessing fluid responsiveness. There are two main ways to assess fluid responsiveness. So either with static indices of preload, such as a central venous pressure, a wedge pressure, central venous O2 sat, or the better way to do it, which is dynamic assessments, which include pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, a passive leg raise, and POCUS. Now, it bears mentioning that in the ICU, we aren't always good at this either, despite our best intentions. So in an ICU-based international study, only one in three providers used any kind of static index before giving bolus fluids, and one in five was using a dynamic index. But these are obviously goals to strive for. So in the next section, we'll delve into some of the evidence behind these four methods of assessing fluid responsiveness and the problems with each. And I'm hoping you'll take away some new tricks or at least some food for thought. So a mini fluid bolus challenge has been described in the literature as a way to assess fluid responsiveness without giving a lot of unnecessary fluid if the patient's no longer fluid responsive. In studies by Gertz and Mallet, Patients were given 100 mils of crystalloid over a minute, and real-time assessments of cardiac output were carried out afterwards. So this was either a velocity time integral assessment of stroke volume using POCUS, or a cardiac index measured using a non-invasive cardiac output monitor, both of which are beyond the scope of this talk, and which we unfortunately don't have access to for most of our eMERGE patients. However, using this kind of theory, you could give the patient a small bolus of fluid, so more like probably 250 mils, and then watch the patient at bedside and use some kind of objective marker that you decide on to assess their perfusion. Certainly a safer way than hanging a liter and then coming back in an hour. Now the first real test for fluid responsiveness that we'll talk about is the passive leg raise. And the theory behind the passive leg raise is that it's a reversible test that can allow you to see if a fluid bolus in the form of approximately 300 mils of fluid from the patient's lower extremities, redistributed centrally, improves their condition. Now, if you want to really understand how to do this test totally by the book, I'll direct you to a paper by Monet and colleagues from Critical Care in 2015. It's called Passive Leg Raise, Five Rules, Not a Drop of Fluid. They're extraordinarily specific about the exact right way to do a passive leg raise. So, to do a passive leg raise, first the patient needs to be lying in bed with the head elevated to a 45 degree angle. Next, you would elevate the legs and the trunk by raising the foot of the bed to 45 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, we don't have even the beds to do this. Um, this is the way it's described in the literature though. Practically, when I'm doing a passive leg raise, it's a bit of a workout for myself and someone else with the other leg, lifting the patient's legs in the air to simulate this. And of note, this can be uncomfortable for the patient, so make sure that they have appropriate analgesia prior. <laughs> 
Now, after you've elevated the patient's legs, you need to reassess whether this has actually helped them and whether the change is reversible after their legs are back down, suggesting that there was nothing else that was modified during that time period. The ideal way to measure this is by assessing cardiac output with your passive leg raise. And this is really the way that the passive leg raise is the most reliable in the literature. A passive leg raise, when done correctly, is really a great test for fluid responsiveness. So in this JAMA systematic review and meta-analysis from 2015, they looked at studies that assessed a number of tests for fluid responsiveness in hemodynamically unstable patients. They found ultimately 50 studies that assessed 2,200 patients, and they compared these tests to the gold standard, which is cardiac output measurement. And what the authors found was that a passive leg raise was the best test out of them all to predict fluid responsiveness. So a positive passive leg raise, i.e. one that was associated with an improvement in cardiac output of 10 to 15 percent, had a positive likelihood for fluid responsiveness of 11, and a negative likelihood of 0.13 if the patient did not respond during that passive leg raise. So from the statistics, the passive leg raise was actually quite a useful test to modify your post-test probability of whether the patient will be fluid responsive with an actual fluid bolus. Now, I realize that unfortunately none of us really has the ability to measure cardiac output in the, ID, in the ED using a SWAN or an ICOM monitor. Um, and some of the ultrasound gurus may use velocity time integral, integral to approximate cardiac index. But for the rest of us, is there anything else that we can use once we have those patients legs in the air for this passive leg raise um, to see if it's worked? So small studies have looked at pulse pressure variation as a way to predict fluid responsiveness in passive leg raise. And they found that pulse pressure variation in combination with a passive leg raise is predictive of fluid responsiveness. And we'll talk about pulse pressure variation a little bit later. Now, studies have been conflicting as to whether an increase in blood pressure is predictive of fluid responsiveness with a passive leg raise. And part of the problem with measuring a blood pressure is that in the time it takes to get a cuff pressure, the patient's hemodynamics may have already improved and then gone back to baseline because the maximum change in cardiac output with a passive leg raise, if it does occur, is going to be within 60 seconds. One study did find that an increase in blood pressure of 10% or more correlated with fluid responsiveness. So even though blood pressure is a static rather than a dynamic measure, it could be a consideration for your patient if you're going to do a passive leg raise and you don't have access to an art line. It's also important to note that there are some patients in which a passive leg raise isn't appropriate, even though it seems like a pretty benign test. So your trauma patients with spines that haven't been cleared, patients in whom you're worried about increased ICP, or those who have increased intra-abdominal pressure would not be appropriate for a passive leg raise. Okay, so now we'll move to the topic that everyone who picks up an ultrasound probe is excited about, which is IVC ultrasound. Now, show of hands, who's using IVC ultrasound now in their assessment of patients in shock? Okay, maybe about a third of people, that's actually less than I expected. So obtaining a view of the IVC is pretty easy. Using a phased array transducer in the sub xiphoid view with the transducer marker towards the patient's head, you can get a really nice view of the IVC, as in this image from the Benser paper. But spoiler alert for the next few slides, IVC ultrasound for fluid responsiveness is quite controversial. I know it's a tool that people do use, um, so I'm hoping that we can discuss some of the pitfalls of IVC like any other test. So the key to IVC ultrasound is that you're actually able to measure it properly. This means you need to see the IVC where it joins up with the right atrium, which is the first pitfall of IVC ultrasound. If you don't see it, it's really easy to get it confused with the abdominal aorta, as in this image. Now the other issue with looking at the IVC is that no one really knows where to measure it. Most authors recommend that you take the measurements approximately two centimeters from the cavoatrial junction using M mode, but a common issue with switching to M mode for your measurements is that while you're looking up at the screen and trying to switch over, your probe starts to slide a bit off kilter, and you won't get accurate measurements unless you're directly perpendicular to the IVC when you're measuring it. So IVC was initially used actually to approximate CVP, and several societies of echocardiography proposed the use of static measurements of IVC uh, to decide whether a patient had a higher or low CVP. This thinking's mostly been abandoned now as nearly everyone's also stopped using CVP as an endpoint for resuscitation. And some authors still do advocate for absolute diameter of IVC, in particular in intubated patients, 
suggesting that if your IVC is really big, greater than two and a half centimeters, the patient's probably full. And if it's really small, so less than about 1.3 centimeters, then potentially the patient will benefit from more fluid. However, it's really only a minority of patients who are going to fall into one of these extremes. More studies, however, have examined the use of the change of in IVC diameter with respiration as a test for fluid responsiveness. Now, as you know, in a spontaneously breathing patient, the negative pressure generated during inspiration should lead to decreased IVC diameter as more of their blood volume is drawn intrathoracically. This is the opposite of a patient on positive pressure ventilation, in which inspiration via a positive pressure breath will lead to positive intrathoracic pressure and a bigger IVC. Now, as you can see from the Stanford diagram, in theory, the bigger the swings in IVC diameter with respiration, as long as everything else is kept constant, the more likely it is that a patient will be fluid responsive. So assuming you have your IVC perfectly, perfectly perpendicular, you can then use M mode, and you can assess the maximum and minimum IVC diameter with respiration and calculate its degree of collapsibility. So, What's the utility of this index, actually? Well, in spontaneously breathing patients, there's a huge amount of variability in studies as to what's significant IVC collapsibility with respiration. Some studies have shown that a collapsibility of 18% is predictive of fluid responsiveness. Others have used a cutoff of 25%. And still others have looked at 50% collapsibility. In the JAMA review by Benser and colleagues that I've mentioned, in spontaneously breathing patients, a collapsibility of 40% had a likelihood ratio positive of 3.5, and a likelihood ratio negative of 0.7 for fluid responsiveness. So not super helpful numbers, and they also only looked at two studies with 100 patients total in those two studies. And this is on top of several previous negative studies which were not included in this meta-analysis, including one negative trial specifically in ED patients with shock. So, IVC variability has not consistently been shown to be predictive of fluid responsiveness in our patients who are spontaneously breathing. Overall, the studies seem to suggest that IVC measurements are potentially more predictive of fluid responsiveness in patients who are mechanically ventilated, but not even just breathing spontaneously on a ventilator. We're talking patients who are paralyzed and fully ventilated. In the Benster meta-analysis, they found that a change in IVC caliber with respiration for patients by 12 to 15 percent had a positive likelihood ratio of 5.3 for fluid responsiveness. And if patients had less than 12 to 15 percent variability, the likelihood ratio negative was 0.27. So these numbers are slightly better than for spontaneously breathing patients. Again, though, this was uh, based on combining four small studies. And a newer meta-analysis by Orso and colleagues, published this year, that the ultrasound group has already reviewed in their journal club, found that there was so much heterogeneity between IVC variability studies and such poor test characteristics that the authors actually concluded that IVC was not a reliable method in any patients to predict fluid responsiveness. So the data really isn't there to support IVC measurements for fluid resuscitation of our patients at this point. And there are many limitations to using IVC, only some of which I'll go over here. So if your patient has pulmonary hypertension, RV failure, or significant tricuspid regurgitation, you should expect that their IVC is going to be distended compared to someone who has a normal heart. Patients with dysrhythmias will also have notoriously variable IVC measurements. And in a patient with tamponade physiology, where one of the ultrasound characteristics of tamponade is a dilated non-variable IVC, Deciding not to give them any fluids while you're pre preparing for definitive management could actually be a really big mistake. Lastly, increased intrathoracic pressure or intra-abdominal pressure will change the diameter of your IVC and the reliability of your findings. So, in terms of a bottom line, I know and we've seen people use the IVC. Um, I've used it too, and, and it's common to see it in notes as, as an assessment measure of fluid responsiveness. But there are big caveats to its use, and the literature suggests it's probably not as good a tool as it might look to you on the screen. If there's any role for it, it's probably in patients who are mechanically ventilated and who have been paralyzed. So maybe your patient just after you've intubated them, rather than your patient who's breathing spontaneously and rapidly. And remember, it's only one tool to combine with the other pieces of information that you have. <laughs> 
After my own read of the literature, I'm personally not going to be using IBC unless I'm already looking at the heart in a patient who is intubated and completely ventilated. Okay, so this is my cue to take a drink, give you 15 seconds to refocus or start daydreaming about Hawaii, and then we'll jump into the last and, in my opinion, the best test, which is pulse pressure variation. Okay, so before we talk about the physiology of pulse pressure variation, we need to talk about the prerequisites for using this test, and there are several of them. Patients need to have an art line in place to measure pulse pressure variation by definition, and they need to be in sinus rhythm. Pulse pressure variation depends on assessing the change in pulse pressure with respiration as an approximation of stroke volume variation, assuming everything else is kept constant. So this is a test that's really only reliable in patients who are on positive pressure ventilation because spontaneous breathing will result in variable changes in intrathoracic pressure and can render the changes in your pulse pressure variation unreliable. Patients also need to be fully mechanically ventilated, so not on a spontaneous breathing mode on the vent. They should have normal chest wall compliance, and they should be taking tidal volumes of eight mils per kilo or more for the period that you're measuring, which of note is probably a bit higher than the six mils per kilo as a standard tidal volume that we're setting for most of our patients. Okay, so we'll go through the physiology of pulse pressure variation for a patient who's mechanically ventilated. This will be the opposite, again, of a patient who's spontaneously breathing, who would normally have a decrease in their blood pressure with inspiration. So, in a patient who's mechanically ventilated, inspiration and lung expansion occur due to positive intrathoracic pressure. The positive intrathoracic pressure will decrease your RV preload. At the same time, it will increase your LV preload because more blood is pushed by that positive pressure back towards the pulmonary veins from the smaller pulmonary blood vessels. The positive uh, pressure will also decrease your LV transmural pressure, which decreases your LV afterload. If the LV is on the steep portion of the Frank Starling curve and will still benefit from increased preload, then you should see a significant increase in your pulse pressure as a result. And we'll talk about what a significant increase is. So, for a patient who benefits from increased LV preload, i.e. one we think would be fluid responsive, they should have an increase in their pulse pressure and their blood pressure with inspiration while they're on the vent. Over the next few seconds then, that LV preload will fall because if you remember, the RV preload is decreased during inspiration. That lower RV preload eventually reaches the LV via the pulmonary circulation. And so after that initial increase in your pulse pressure with inspiration, you should see a decrease in pressure, and for most, pa most patients, this will coincide with expiration. So we use pulse pressure variation because it's been shown to approximate stroke volume variation. And remember, I told you we're keeping everything else, so intrathoracic pressure, blood volume, constant, but we're assessing specifically the variation in pulse pressure based on changes in preload with respiration. So how do you actually calculate pulse pressure variation? Now, first, on your art line monitor, you need to change your speed setting. So in this picture, you'll notice a typical art line tracing at the top. And if you condense your waveform to a baseline of 6.25 millimeters per second, instead of the typical 25 millimeters per second that we're used to seeing, and the nurses can likely do this for you on the monitor, then as you'll see at the bottom, you can see the variation in your pulse pressure with respiration more easily. Next, and, and you can also do this with a printout, you'll calculate your maximum and minimum pulse pressure. So you'll find your highest systolic pressure with inspiration. This will be the starting point for your maximum pulse pressure. And you'll measure it as well as the diastolic pressure on that same waveform. Then you'll find your lowest systolic pressure, which would be with expiration. And you'll measure out the systolic and diastolic pressures on that same waveform. So now you've got your pulse pressure maximum and your pulse pressure minimum. Now, the third step is to calculate the pulse pressure variation. It's a pretty simple equation. So you'll calculate the difference between your maximum and minimum pulse pressures, and divide that by the average of those pressures added together, and you'll end up with a number as a percentage. Okay, so what does it all mean? Well, essentially, the greater the pulse pressure variation, the more likely the patient is to be fluid responsive. <laughs> 
In multiple studies, a pulse pressure variation of 12% or more has been found reliable to predict fluid responsiveness. In Paul Merrick's meta-analysis of ICU studies, a pulse pressure variation of 12% or more had very good test characteristics for, pre for um, predicting fluid responsiveness, with a likelihood ratio positive of 7.2 and a likelihood ratio negative of 0.12. And a more recent analysis by Yang and colleagues found nearly identical likelihood ratios, actually, to the Merrick study. Okay, so I realize that the last part on pulse pressure variation is complex. But especially for our residents who are going to rotate through ICU, I'd really encourage you to try and go through the steps to calculate it out and use your art line as another tool. So summarizing what we've talked about, fluid is a drug and one that we give frequently, often without thinking about the consequences. But in our sickest patients, an extra two liters of fluid that they didn't need can really increase their morbidity and mortality in hospital. It's really in these patients that we need to be carefully considering whether they're fluid responsive still. And if they are, then we can, con we can continue to confidently fill the tank. There are many ways to assess fluid responsiveness. So you can decide to give a small fluid bolus, stay at the bedside, and decide if your resuscitation goals are better met after that bolus. You can give a reversible fluid bolus in the form of a passive leg raise. And as we discussed, the best way to use this is in combination with pulse pressure variation or non-invasive cardiac output monitoring or ultrasound assessment of stroke volume if you have access to that. Now, I may or may not have swayed the IVC enthusiasts away from using IVC. It's another test that's commonly used for fluid responsiveness, but it's got lots of caveats and is in particular not reliable for our patients who are not intubated. And lastly, we talked about pulse pressure variation. This is certainly the most complex of the tests, but next time you put in an art line, consider looking at the monitor and trying to go through those steps to calculate the variation. So let's go back to Mabel, our 74-year-old who's septic and still in shock based on her end organ perfusion on exam and on labs. You're concerned about her lungs and she's starting to require some supplemental oxygen. So rather than give her another one to two liters of fluid, you decide to set up an art line and you start some vasopressors. You reassess her fluid responsiveness after you started the norepinephrine using a combination of passive leg raise and pulse pressure variation. And you decide that with an improvement in her pulse pressure variation of only 5%, she's likely no longer fluid responsive. Her perfusion improves after you titrate up the norepinephrine and her lactate on repeat measurement starts to come down. ICU arrives to see the patient and admit her to the unit for ongoing care. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions now.